The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Our guest today, Leonard Martin, known as Jay, grew up in a tough neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. At 14, he began a dancing career with his friends and performed at talent shows, pep rallies, concerts, trade shows, and even performed at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. It's a world-class theater, as far as I'm concerned. After starting a family in 2001, Jay moved to Columbus, Ohio, had another child, and continued his career with Coca-Cola until a forced retirement in 2017 when a heart attack and 26 strokes disabled him, but gifted him with a remarkable NDE and miraculous recovery after 24 hours of being considered dead. Jay lost his job, his home, and his former identity and had to literally start over. He developed a neurological disability, nerve damage, PTSD, and other medical conditions as a result. But Jay benefited from having been an avid meditator since 2011 and a very spiritual person. Jay says, quote, meditation is a very important tool in my life and keeps me grounded and connected to God and his infinite wisdom. Jay's the author of The Second Time Around, a memoir about a life and a life, a death, and a second chance. And he created a company called Dallas Aromatherapy and Meditation Sanctuary, LLC, to help people experience the beauty and benefits of meditation and aromatherapy. Jay Martin, welcome to NDE Radio. Uh, Thank you much for having me. Really appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, um, it's, uh, I said that you grew up in a tough neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Um, but, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little about your life growing up and why your family was such a, um, a, a good influence on you. Uh, All right. I'll do the best I can. <laughs> okay. Well, um, as I, you know, mentioned, yeah, I, um, I grew up on the South side of Chicago in the Inglewood area. Um, you know, family was very supportive with everything we did, you know, um, you know, that the love and support that they gave was like one of the, like one of the foundations to keeping me, you know, sane and not going crazy in some of the things I experienced, you know. Yeah. Um, my, we start when I, when I was born, we kind of started off like in a, my dad was a drug dealer, you know, and uh, uncles and cousins were in gangs and uh, we had some tumultuous times with, police raids on the house often and as kids we wasn't really scared you know but it was it's bad when it becomes a norm (laughs) you know yes (laughs) you know but um my grandparents at the time wasn't having it but nevertheless my dad and them were (laughs) hard-headed but um during those things my mom she decided she didn't want us to live that life so she decided to move us to uh a different environment and even we was about to go to the projects of Chicago I don't know if you guys heard the history of the projects it was pretty rough yeah. and my mom's grandmother she didn't want us to go my mom's mother she didn't want us to go to the project so she bought she bought us a home um only several blocks yeah. away and um when we got to that home, we still kept in contact with the family because it was, you know, walking distance, <laughs> you know. Um, but, yeah, and seeing all those things and experience all those things, it kind of, I think the family reunions, the gatherings, the family talks, the, uh, uh, the dinners, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Sunday dinners and stuff like that, those were some of the main things that, like, kept me from even thinking about what was going on on the outside you know yeah well you uh pretty much stayed clean didn't you uh avoided drugs and alcohol and all the stuff that uh probably all your uh friends were doing oh yeah oh yeah my uh it it was when I was younger primarily my father you know selling it and my uncles were selling it and 
unfortunately, which happens commonly with people who sell drugs, they end up using it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I just didn't want to go that route, <laughs> you yeah. know, because I saw all the things that came with it. And I was like, nah, that's not for me. It's not worth it. You know, <laughs> were you my friends? Yeah. That, I was just going to ask you, were you raised in any religious tradition? Well, my mom uh, was ironic because my mom grew up Baptist, you know, and my grandmother, however, she wasn't much of a church goer. My mom's mom, she wasn't much of a church goer, goer but her mother, my great grandmother, heavy church goer, <laughs> you know. So yeah. they, my great grandmother used to have gospel, you know, on all the time. My my mom still has gospel on all the time. <laughs> and, you know, and as yeah. young kids, you know, they would push, you know, tell you about being a Baptist and all that, but you'd be like, kids, you like, I really don't care to hear that, mom. So would I have fun, you know? So there you were, you, you pulled through all, all of the uh, possible damage you could have uh, run into growing up. And then uh, on uh, in August of 2016, I guess that's when uh, uh, you really suffered some bad physical uh, events. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, a couple of years, a few years prior, I was diagnosed with uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, this one blood clot in my lung. Um, but it was like years leading up to it, it was diagnosis after diagnosis after diagnosis. It just seemed like they kept coming every other year. Mm -hmm. you know, lupus, uh, and severe depression, anxiety, um, then a pulmonary embolism and angina, like several months before the incident happened. And my, my doctor at the time, she told me, you know, be careful. I want you to stay on your blood thinners because it can be fatal if you get off these blood thinners and that blood clot goes to your heart, stop it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think much of it, you know, I was just like, okay, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon, but I was still taking my medicine. So one evening, I said evening of August 17th, um, after coming in from work, uh, I felt a funny feeling in my chest, but I didn't know what it was and I wasn't really worried, but it was just a funny feeling, no pain or anything. And I... Before turning in, I proceeded to call my friend and my mom, you know, something I seldomly do sometimes. So after I made that last phone call, next thing you know, I'm waking up in a hospital almost a week later. Wow. You know, I had no remembrance of what happened. You know, I wanted, to, I, I meant to ask you, uh, what kind of dancing were you doing? Were you doing break dancing at all? Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, well, I, when I was younger, I started off like, I was like eight, seven years old. I started off break dancing, but in Chicago, um, the common dance was called house, house dancing, you know, uh -huh. it's like a cousin of hip hop. Okay. So that wasn't as uh, hard on your neck and your head as break dancing. <laughs> <laughs> oh no because <laughs> uh, oh, what, no. what i what i was thinking was you know you were pretty young when the at 20, in 2016 um but maybe there was some damage from the initial dancing you know if you if you were uh uh you know anything anything involving the neck and the head and the spine uh could really complicate your blood flow and might have contributed to the heart attack you know, what was ironic is that because um, I have asthma as well, I was born with asthma. Uh -huh. um, with my dancing, I actually was under better control of my asthma with my dancing because my heart was always racing and majority of our dancing was upward. So we wasn't spinning on my head. So I wasn't doing that again. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or things like that. Right. Uh, so <laughs> it contributed to me feeling well. And I had a clean bill of health. Um so like I had other than the asthma, I had a clean bill of health until I moved to Columbus. And that's just where just like stepping, just something after something after something. Yeah. Well, they thought you, the uh, the hospital staff at any rate, thought you were a goner. Uh, and they told that to your family, didn't they? Tell us, tell us what, what, how they diagnosed that and what they said to your family. Sure. Um, when, it happened, uh, I was just, because like I said, I was out. Uh, it happened like 
early morning 2018. And they called my family and told them, they said, well, you know, need to, you know, hurry up and get here. He's in bad shape. You know, uh, we don't know, basically, we don't know what's going to go on, but he's in bad shape. Hurry up and get here. And my family's in Chicago. You know, my children was here with their mom. So they started to get ready, you know, and come my way. And about, I think, I think they said it was about 40 minutes or so. They called them and told them that they're sorry it's too late that I was gone. You know, um, my mom and my sister, they were telling me their reaction that, you know, they fell to the ground crying when they heard it, you know, and it was erratic and everything. And um, my children, they were also notified because um, my oldest daughter, she was 18 at the time, she was notified. And she told of course, my, her siblings, which is around, they, my youngest ended up calling my now wife and she had just got home from work and told her dad's dead, yeah. you know? So she rushed back out to the hospital to, uh, you know, to come to me. And what was ironic, also ironic was that I was a floor above her in the hospital when she was there working. She didn't even know it. Mm. She was, she was on the staff there. Was she a nurse? Uh, she was a, at the time she was a technician. Okay. You know. At some point, uh, maybe I saw this in your book, you were bleeding from all over or even from your eyes. Is that true? Oh yeah. Um, because when they came, when they first arrived, like my mom first arrived, like uh, I want to say that afternoon or something like that. She got off the elevator and my uh, children, my children's mom, my, my Mother got the elevator. Was like, okay, where's my baby? Had it, you know. Yeah. And my children's mom said he's over there, but he's been gone all day. So she again fell to the ground crying. And when they came in, because it was already half the day, my body had started to swell. Um, I had my skin was cracking, uh, blood coming from my skin that was cracking. It was coming from other orifices like my eyes and uh and yeah because everything it was like nothing pumping my heart no blood to my body because everything has stopped heart everything they they still had you on a ventilator though is that right uh i believe they had me on the ventilator to uh yeah i believe they had me on the ventilator yeah okay but my organ but yeah because my lungs my lungs were of course they wasn't ready to work they were all stopped yeah you know so you were on a ventilator but you had no pulse and yes. you've you'd been uh pronounced dead yes okay so at what point did you uh start your nde uh well uh what was ironic was what was funny was that i didn't even know that i was deceased <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah i i actually thought that maybe i was sleeping you know well, so were you were you out of your body at all? Do you re recall uh, looking down at yeah, your body? Yeah, because every and, and what was so and what was what was so funny everything that happened afterward while I was you know gone if it was like no fear it was normal you know I I um, I don't know how I got to this place but I was like walking down a tunnel. Yeah, you said and, it was like an amber opal or, or yeah oval like oval a, shape. Yeah, like a like a you know, an amber tunnel, you know, where it's like goes around and you just walk like walking through it, and there were like people or hands with hands just like reaching out, but it wasn't like malicious because I didn't have any fear or anything, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't have a body. All I know, I was just looking around me and you know people reaching up, you know, around me, and I'm just just con just continued going down that tunnel um but they were people they weren't like angels or right they were people uh i didn't see anything that would you know give them the classification of anything else but like people hmm. yeah interesting and when then I, I, think, I then i think you were suddenly on a 
I think in the book it said you were in, on an empty highway in Columbus going past historic landmarks. Yeah, uh, I was, you know, it was like I was just, just, you know, just going, you know, floating yeah. or whatever it may be. And it was like an empty highway. Nobody was out. It was kind of gloomy. And I passed like a couple of landmarks that I recognized. One of them was on uh, those who live in Columbus. You no, know, what is this? Front Street, the Burby District. Um, I passed that and was on the highway and I don't know what happened, but it was like I was immediately in space, shot straight to space. Mm. And while up there again, nobody, I wasn't fear, you know, I didn't have any emotions. Um, it's like I was just existing, you know, I was just there. And <laughs> at the foot, like at the at my foot, like further down, I saw the earth, you know, and it, of course it was huge. And what looked like a in a form of a tree coming off the earth with like energy just circulating within and out. But it was resemblance of a tree, uh-huh. you know. And to my left, I saw like a, um, it was like a, a swirl of stars you know, like a wormhole, but it was like a swirl of stars, like a wormhole. And what was so funny was that about two years ago, I ended up found, I saw that same image like in, like a, um, like on, online. And it was the Andromeda galaxy, hmm. you know? And I was like, that's what I saw, you know? So I was kind of wigged out, you know? <laughs> First when I go like, I actually saw something that they know about, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And, um, you know, and then I heard my name called. I don't know where it came from. I don't know who called it. And it was called, you know, a few more times. And I would look over, look around. And I didn't see where it was coming from. And then I would see the earth. And then I would look at the stars again. I was just looking around. And then all of a sudden, went black. You know, and I don't know what's the time frame, but. When I did wake up, I, my family, and I mean, because I was kind of surprised my family, because my family haven't came up to see me in Chicago uh-huh. that often. <laughs> so, so yeah, I saw my family in like an aura. It was like an energy surrounding them. Wow. It was, it was surreal. I wasn't scared either. I was, I, I say this to people and this may sound, um, what's the word, morbid, but it was the best rest I ever had in my life. <laughs> People talk a lot about uh, the feeling, having the feeling of love. Did you sense that at all when you were there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know what? Uh, that energy that I saw around my family, uh, I recognized it as love, you oh, know. Yeah. Um, and that's how I found out. And I knew it because of where I was and what I was feeling at the time. And I knew that I found out that love is actual and ent- is an actual entity, Yeah. you know. Let me let me take you back to that tree too that you saw. Was it was it coming up from the earth or was it right embedded in the image of the earth? It was it was like it was almost like the roots were embedded in earth. Yeah. And the trunk and then the tree, you know, branches and stuff like that. But the roots wasn't like, you know, brown roots that you see on earth and stuff like that. It was like energy, you know, just flowing and rotating in and out. And it was, was it flowing up or or into the earth or was it circular? Just like circulating, like um, almost like currents, you know, how it goes up and then it comes back down and goes up and comes back down and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Just like currents flowing in and out, different paths. Did it have light to it or or the feeling of love or anything it did. like that? It was, it was, it was, the energy was the light that I saw. You know, it was the energy I saw going up, and that, that was about the only light that I witnessed. Wow. But you didn't see anyone else. Uh, you didn't see anyone. The, when you heard your name called, there weren't any beings around. No, no one mentioned it. You know, um, I mean, I didn't know who called me. And maybe your family calling you from bedside? It's, po- it's possible because what was. What was uh, funny was that when my mom then was by my bedside and I was, you know, deceased, clinically dead, my nephew called from Chicago 
And he told my mom, he said, I just woke up and I just saw Uncle Jay. You know, Uncle Jay was telling you guys to, let me tell you guys to stop rubbing on him, <laughs> you know. And my mom, they started, they started to, you know, trip because they was actually rubbing on my arm, <laughs> you know. And he said he saw me in like a dark room, but me personally, I don't remember it, but he said he saw me. And this was all going on while I was, you know, gone. And he was in Chicago and he got a message from you and then called your family in Columbus. Yes. <laughs> Weird. Yeah, because they got goosebumps, you know. <laughs> yeah, because because you told him what was going on and he told them that must have, must have made them feel strange. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. My family, it was one of the funny things is my family found out the hard way that when you're in a hospital and they bring you this little black bowl, uh -huh. you know, you don't <laughs> eat from the black bowl because it's like the, uh, what is it, like the bereavement bowl, you know, uh -huh. and my my family thought that they were just being nice and giving them candy and stuff like that. <laughs> my girlfriend, she's like, no, no, don't eat from that bowl. <laughs> This all thought they were just being nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I think your your nephew in Chicago said you also asked about your kids. Yeah, yeah. He said what he said that I said, what about my kids? You know, and my children, they mean the world to me. You know, um, everything that I've done was for them. And I actually stayed in Columbus, Ohio for them. You know, uh, I just wasn't gonna leave them. You know, I promised them, I said. I will all, when everyone was born, I said, I will never leave you. I will always be here for you when you need me. And I guess I carried that to my deathbed and meant it. <laughs> well, what did the doctors say when suddenly you were, uh, you're back alive again? Oh, they were, they were shocked. You know, they, they couldn't explain it. You know, they told my mom, they said, we don't know what's going on <laughs> or how this happened, but his heart slowly started to beat. And they said, and even though his heart started to beat, we don't know what his quality of life is going to be because all his organs and everything has shut down. And now they have to come back. And he was saying I only had a 20-something chance of survival, but they said keep going anyway. And the doctors, they 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 just didn't understand it. They were like shocked and profound. And it was even so weird that I went back for my checkup one day and the surgeon, the doctor who was like with the main doctor uh, who was working with me, he said, uh, I told my wife about this situation. We couldn't believe it. And this may sound funny, but can I take a picture with you? I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, my neurologist, my uh, cardiologist, he, I go get a checkup for him every like annual checkup. And he tells me all the time, he said, he said, you are a miracle. He said, I tell my colleagues about you all the time. He said, because you were gone, my friend. He said, you was not here, mm. you know? And it's remarkable because like I said, I tell them all, all the time. Every time we have conversations, I mention that story, you know? And everyone in the Ohio Health Network after I started going to like therapy, everywhere I went, they would ask me questions. Every person in these, the doctor's offices, you know, say, they say oh, you, that's you. Did you, what did you see? <laughs> you know, tell me what you see, you know? And I'm like, I'm just here to get my checkup, but okay, <laughs> you know? And I found myself telling the story just about everywhere I went, you know? But yeah, they, they, they were all shocked about it. They couldn't explain it. Now you talk about having 26 strokes after after your heart attack. Was that right after the heart attack or was that after you came back? It was right after the heart attack. Uh, I was put in, when they first got the faint heartbeat, they put me on a machine called an ECMO machine, which gives your heart some rest. So it can, you know, so it can pump the blood, the ECMO machine can pump the blood for you. Yes, And they usually use this machine no more than three days, but they had me on it for six days, <laughs> you know. And while I was in that medically induced coma, that's when I had the strokes. Mm -hmm. You know, it was because the um, what started off at, as one blood clot when I was first diagnosed turned to three blood clots when it happened. Mm -hmm. And 
afterwards, like I said, in the medically induced coma, they just, blood clots just got loose and spread, just went some everywhere, you know, um, and it was about 26 in total. Wow. When you were in the coma, do you recall anything, uh, uh, let me say spiritual? Did you leave your body again or were you just asleep? I was just asleep. You know, I was resting. Um, yeah. And I didn't actually, I didn't, most of the stuff that like when I was out, uh, you know, out in and out from the, um, I don't remember. I just remember resting because everything was just like clear. There was no thoughts of anything. I was just clear. You know, uh, I remember every time I opened my eyes, seeing somebody different, you know, uh, seeing my buddy who came from Chicago, who I also used to dance with. Uh, he developed MS in 2005 and is wheelchair bound and him and his wife and kids came up, you know, to see me. So I remember the faces every time some oh my somebody different was there. Now, your wife was just someone you had dated a couple times, I guess, at that time. But uh, <laughs> she was by your side. You were in the hospital for what, one and a half months and she stayed by your side. Pretty consistent. Oh, yeah. 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 Because we had dated in, and this is, it's a, excuse me, it's a heck of a way to start a date with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you start talking to somebody in December, 2015, you become serious and start exclusively dating yep. in January of 2016. Next thing you know, a few months later, you get a call saying your boyfriend's dead, <laughs> you know? And so when it happened, like I said, she was, when I opened my eyes, she was there. A lot of times I opened my eyes, she was there. She was singing, playing music on her phone to me that I like and everything. And um, yeah, she was up there every day. I think my my uh, sister-in-law, she had to tell her to go home because she wouldn't go home. <laughs> she, you know, she stayed up there. She was like, go get some rest. I got this. She said, we need some rest. And she just, it was, she just found it hard to leave and yeah, and she just stayed and I was really shocked. And I, like I said, I was, I was in the best feeling I ever had in my life. You know, um, I had no concerns. I wasn't thinking about anything, nothing bad. I was just existing. I was just there. And um, I had the trait connected to me. I still have my trach hole right here. Um, and I couldn't talk because the other part is in my mouth and everything and I'm sitting there and she's holding my hand and I look over then I look back over and my a tear start rolling down my eye I started to you know cry a little bit and I just like wow I looked at it again and like held her hand so she can like acknowledge me and then I said will you marry me just using my mouth you know and she she said yes of course and I was I think that was the one of the first emotions that I actually had after coming back was the emotion of asking this woman to marry me. And it was a divine thing because I was not under any pressure. I wasn't impulsed or anything. I was I was just amazing. I was a new person, you know. Yeah. And asking her to marry me was something that that spirit told me to do. I had to do it. Yeah. Well, she'd seen you at your worst. So I guess oh, yeah. if she said yes at that point, uh, that was right. You know, to fit the part wasn't <laughs> supposed to go with somebody in your date. <laughs> right. Or <laughs> that, that's right. And especially uh departing and then coming back. That, right. That's even that's even more complicated. Oh yeah, uh, indeed. Now now when you I th I think uh maybe in, in the book you said everything seemed foreign when you you had to relearn how to walk and talk and write and all of that oh yeah when i awake what was so funny was that when i awoke yeah. regained consciousness at first it seemed like this was the dream but mm -hmm. there was the normal part you know and i guess i was just existing and then i was just like sitting in my bed one day like we're lying in my bed, hospital bed, and they some therapists came and said, "Well, time to come up for your therapy." I was like, "What do I need therapy for?" You know, so I started to get ready and 
drag my legs around, move my legs around so I can try to stand up and get ready for therapy. And I almost fell, <laughs> you know? And I was like, okay, my legs is not working now. That's weird, <laughs> you know? So uh, I went through the extensive therapy of trying to regain strength in my leg again to learn how to walk. Um, that was a challenge. Um, I had to do occupational therapy to uh, learn how to do certain, just some of the basic things around the home, but predominantly learn how to uh, read <laughs> again, understand what I was saying, being able to talk, you know, I learned how to talk, my cognitive skills, uh, writing. That was the frustrating part, <laughs> you know, because I couldn't tell somebody that I knew I needed something. So I tried to write it down. They still didn't understand, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. Uh, that was the frustrating part, but yeah, I pretty much had to learn everything all over again. Yeah, it was a task. And she got me to each and every therapy session that I had to do, take off, took off work and everything. She, yeah, she was amazing. Yeah. Now to, to go back a little bit, some about five years before all this happened, um, you, you took up meditation. What what uh, motivated you to do that? Well, I was, um, I think I was listening to something on the radio or something, and I heard something about uh, a book called Autobiography of a Yogi um, by Paramahansa Yogananda. Yep. And I, I was, and just hearing about it, I was like, huh. Okay, let me check it out. So I bought the book and the book was so good that I probably finished it in a week, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it's a big book. I know, because I've, I've read it myself. Oh yeah, you know, he was speaking about Kriya Yoga in there. So uh, he developed a, a, center, with a, a center in Los Angeles, in LA, on California, uh, Self-Realization Fellowship. So I called them, you know, joined the fellowship and I started doing a Kriya Yoga practices. And at first I couldn't sit still for five minutes, you know, things racing and everything. But then after a while, it started to become a normal thing. And I improved, improved, improved throughout the, you know, months and years. And it helped me because I was going through so much, so much in my life and I hadn't vented, you know, I just didn't, um, address it, you know, and I needed something to calm me down and to help ground me and bring me closer to God. And when I started that Kriya Yoga practice, it, it, it helped tremendously. It was, yeah, and I still practice it today, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, it, it, it was what I needed. It was what I needed. It helped me. And I often tell people that that asked me, they said, what it was like, what was it like? What was it feeling? And I tell them that, <clears throat> excuse me, the closest thing that I can come to even describing what I felt or what I experienced was during my meditations. You know, because some of my meditations were just just like otherworldly, you know, and this amazing feeling. And that was what I felt when it happened. So it was like, that was probably the closest. So I was like, you want to get the, I don't recommend you doing what I did, dying. We don't want you to die. Um, <laughs> but tr try meditate. Try to meditate. And you still get some of the best feeling when you do it. When you get into it. That self-realization center out there. Uh, my brother belonged to that when he was living in that area. Yeah. And uh, he, he's still a member, but he, he's in Texas now. Um, Helps. <laughs> the, um, uh, the experience of meditation, um, do you, did you ever uh, have uh, anything like the visions you had in, in your NDE? Um, it, wasn't it wasn't like the exact visions that, I, you know, that, that happened with my NDE. But there were times where I felt like I was in another world. <laughs> you know, I was so relaxed that I forgot that I was still here. <laughs> you know, I forgot that I was even breathing, right. you know. Um, but it was, 
Yeah, sometimes it was even, uh, I want to say celestial, you know, where you like space and, you know, things like that. And yeah, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> well, when you came back, you said the other side was, you felt like that was reality and that life on earth was a dream. Does meditation put you in that same frame of mind? It does. It, it can. It, it can. With me, it has done that, you know, when I meditate for like a long period of time. You know, and then I come back and I'm like, it feels like artificial being back, you know, but mm. because the meditating wasn't, you know, probably about an hour, you know, I come back and it's like, well, I wasn't gone that long to remember that I was here, <laughs> you know, right. but that feeling, yeah, it, it has that same effect. Do you ever think that maybe your uh, experience with meditation was the factor that kept you alive during the the stress of your heart attack and and strokes uh in other, I, in other I words that, that you were familiar with that frame of mind enough to yes know. yeah because with meditation it, it one of the things it did it helped me to remain calm in some of the most hectic situations that i may be in so when everything happened uh after everything happened yeah i was i knew how to remain calm you know, I knew how to be centered and just be in where I am at that moment. You know, um, the nurses even asked like my mom and my girlfriend sometime because they would come in and see me smiling, you know, or laughing. They say, is he OK? They said, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he, he just does that. sometimes." <laughs> you know, you know, then they would ask when they when they like stitching me up or something like that, they would ask me okay, do you want certain medicine? Do you want Tylenol or whatnot? And like I said, I was in a good place. I was like, nah, just go ahead and stitch it up. Uh, uh, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't bother me. Nothing bothered me at all. Wow. Yeah, other than trying to get somebody to understand what I was saying, you know? Yeah. yeah oh, sure. <laughs> well, listen, uh, but things weren't perfect after you got back because you lost your job, you lost your house. Talk a little uh, about yeah. about how you uh, survived all that. Well, um, it happened, like I said, late 2016, but in, like I want to say late in early 2017, my job was expecting me to come, you know, was hoping that I would come back, but they knew I had to rest. And uh, because of our union, they can only hold my job for a certain period of time. Um, so after several months, they ended up letting me go. Um, I couldn't take care of my home anymore because I was no longer able to financially do it or physically do it. So I had to file for bankruptcy and, you know, took the home away, of course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, and about my job, they were so supportive at first when it happened because even my regional supervisor, they all came to see me when it happened. And I still have the letter since they got the news, they had to report everything. So I still got the letter where the insurance company from Coke, they sent the condolences letter to my family telling them that we were notified of the death of your loved one, Leonard Martin, you know? And to see that letter, it was like morbid, <laughs> you know, like it's talking about me, you know? But I figured that since they were so supportive at that, but at those times and whatnot that I was still have my job, but. Uh, they couldn't keep it, so they let me go. I lost a home, and I was just trying to focus on getting well, you know, and, um, you know, just, you know, that's, that was just my main focus. It was, however, the hardest part was that now I was very sensitive to energies and feelings of how people felt in the energy they gave off, and whenever... On our wife, uh, whenever she was going through something, and her stepdad, you know, whenever they were going through something, when I, I felt it, you know, and it was almost depressing and sad, you know, kind of made me want to cry at times, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so feeling all these energies, it just made me feel bad, you know. Then watching television with the uh, uh, election things going on and all the craziness, it started to make me feel even more sad you know and tearing up at often and 
so I had to deal with that and it it sucked feeling that way you know yeah, um sure. on top of having to still relearning how to walk you know and other things and I developed uh like I said the neurological issue where a lot of the strokes were in my cerebellum you know uh was controlled like uh, equilibrium and things. So I have vertigo, uh, every day, um, all day. Some days are better than others. Uh, medicine doesn't help. It's pretty indefinite, you know, according to my neurologist. So I try to push through it, you know, every day, you know, cause that's what I do. I'm pretty optimistic, <laughs> you know, about feeling better. Um, it was hard you know, had trouble and I still do have trouble like reading, reading books, you know, the words, they just get jumbled up and I get really dizzy. Um, sometimes I get lightheaded from a lack of oxygen to my brain. It still bothers me if I talk too much. Uh, I get nauseous. <laughs> I had insomnia for three years, maybe four wow. years after that. Wow. Uh, I couldn't sleep at all uh, because uh, it, it was like time didn't exist there. So it was like being here it was like my body was like not on anybody's time. I was just existing, just here, you know. So sleep wasn't that important to me until it started to become important to me. <laughs> you know, I yeah. started getting sicker. So when I did try to at least get to sleep, I was I started to get afraid because I was afraid that I wouldn't wake up. You know, because I thought I was asleep last time and I was actually gone. So I wouldn't know the difference, you know, so I was pretty afraid of that. Um, and it wasn't so much that I was afraid of death. It was just like, I felt like I had something to do still. I wasn't ready to go again just yet. You know, I still have something to accomplish. Right. You know, um, and it was trying to find, you know, I was hard headed because I was trying to find work to be able to take care of my family better. Uh, but I went through programs to see what I could do because of disability, couldn't do anything practically, you know, so I couldn't find work, you know, I couldn't even try if I wanted to, because my body just wasn't letting me, it's just not letting me, so um, it's, 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 I want to say been kind of challenging, you know, because I'm used to being a provider, you know, for years for my family, I'm used to making sure everybody had what they needed, you know, and now I'm in a position where I'm limited, you know, so right. that's when I tried to start the business. <laughs> Started off as a nonprofit. So I found out how cool the nonprofit world can be and <laughs> challenging. <laughs> so I had to turn it to a for-profit. That was challenging as well. And I was just trying everything that I can do to help bring an income. You know, so that's where the biggest task was just trying to provide better than what I was doing. And even though it's hard, I'm still not giving up on that business to trying to help people to experience meditation and aromatherapy and find some kind of relaxation. I still want, I, I'm still driven to do it. I don't, I didn't care how many no's or how many people wasn't going to do this or fund me. I still want to keep trying, you know. Have you found um, meditation and aromatherapy work for you to some oh, extent? Yeah. yeah, I have diffusers <laughs> around my home, you know. And, yeah. um, my wife, she used to bring diffusers up to my uh, hospital room too, oh. you know, and everybody would come, oh, it smells so good in here. I'm like, you guys not smell this even a little bit on this floor? They're like, nah. <laughs> nah. So they enjoy coming to my room just for the aromatherapy. <laughs> But what, uh, um, what kind of oils do you use? Uh, me personally, um, I love eucalyptus. Uh, opens you up, you know, just invigorates you. Um, my wife likes citrus, citrus things. Um, that's not my cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, eucalyptus, peppermint oil, um, uh, vetiver. I believe that's one. I just discovered that about two years ago for uh called depression stress and this relaxing too so yeah, yeah when, i have to switch up every night and too when coca-cola let you go did you lose your health insurance yes oh boy yeah. 
yeah, I lost my health insurance. Uh, and at the time, I kind of, I was trying to like, okay, maybe I can get my, at least get my pension that was left over, you know, and oh, it was like pulling teeth. They just refused to give it to me, you know, and here we are hemorrhaging, you know, so um, they ended up turning it around about a year later to where they decided to give everybody pension buyouts, <laughs> you know, to, to avoid making it about disability and stuff but nevertheless I got it it helped you know for a little while uh but yeah my insurance was gone I had to get put on a Medicare and uh I think it was a Medicaid or something for my insurance Me- Medicaid and SSI do you you must qualify yes. for that good yeah good. I ended up getting that you know that helped it's, it helps <laughs> every yeah. bit helps oh so, yeah uh, of course yeah so I mean God provided you know, he still does. And I, I don't, you know, I always say that everything is going to work out the way it's supposed to, regardless. Yeah. What's, what's your relationship with God now? How do you feel about all this? Still strong, still strong. Uh, it, it didn't waver at all. Um, you know, however, I, I was trying to figure out what my purpose was. You know, because everyone would say that God brought you back for a purpose. He wasn't ready to let you go. And I was like, okay, but I don't know that purpose. I'm sitting here trying to get well, but I'm not really sure of that purpose. So I would, again, continue praying, never stop that. Meditating, um, I stopped for a little bit, then I got back into it because I was, you know, me, I was failing. And the prayer didn't stop. It just kept getting stronger and stronger and asking for wisdom and asking for whatever, let his will be done. Whatever he have laid out for me, I humbly accept, you know, and I just, I've just been, you know, happy to just to be here, just that he allowed me to be here, you know, so I'm forever and always grateful. I thank him every day, all day, every day, clock like clockwork. You know, is there a a branch of self-realization fellowship in Columbus? Uh, I found it. There is. Um, Yeah. yeah. Um, I've never attended one, though. Um, I considered it. But like I said, the health sometimes he's going out for a little while and then COVID, (laughs) you know, if we having all these conditions, I was like, I I, I do it right here where I'm at, (laughs) you know, like some. YouTube videos or something, you know, but yeah, I couldn't, it, it, it was rough to get out to like a bunch of crowds, you know, but they do have one here. They when you them. consider the stress in the world right now, uh, you know, the political and economic stresses that people are going through, uh, the racial stresses that people are putting each other through, meditation would be a really healing thing. And if you could find a way to get people interested in it, either by teaching it or promoting it somehow, I know you tried this once, but it seems like it would be a valuable thing for you to, to look at. Yeah. Well, uh, I started my website, uh, last year, um, uh, daleth-am-sanctuary.com. And on my site, since I, cause I don't, I'm not a salesperson. I can't mm-hmm. sell your own shoes back to you. That's how bad I am. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so with my website, I decided to just make it a resource website to where if anyone wanted to know anything about meditation, what devices out there, where they can find them at, uh, aromatherapy, they can find it on my site. You know, when they get there, they want to know what YouTube videos to look at. Anything they wanted to know about meditation aromatherapy, I figured that maybe I, at least I can show them on my site, you know, you know, so I'm I'm st- still trying to, you know. How do they find your site? Uh, it is, of course, is, you can Google it as well, but it's uh, Daleth D-A-L-E-T-H-A-M-Sanctuary.com. Okay. And tell them about Daleth why you chose that name 
Uh, well, in I want to say it's, I was about 15 years old, and me and my buddies, we were dancing, traveling, and everything. And uh, uh, one of our one of our one of the brothers that I danced with, he suggested about this uh, Hebrew Knesset that we visit. You know, so we visited the Knesset. Um, found out some things and found out, I think it was in Proverbs where it said a good name is better than a precious ointment. Mm. So everyone decided that they would find names that were, that were fitting for them in their lives, you know? So um, I chose my name as Uzziel or strength of God. And ever since I've just been interested in everything, a lot of things associated with Hebrew, Hebrew letters, Hebrew words, Hebrew studies. And one of the letters in Hebrew was uh, the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet called Daleth. And this its symbol represents a door, it's a triangle. So when I brought up the logo for my company, I felt it was fitting because I felt that my company would be a door for people to find God, you know, through meditation and aromatherapy. You know, hence the uh the logo is is actually a triangle on there, so that's where I, that's why I chose that logo as it uh, to represent a door for people to find God through meditation and there. For some reason, a thought just went through my mind that maybe you should find if there's a a synagogue nearby that would like to offer uh, some classes in uh, meditation and that uh, you might volunteer there and make some connections because that yeah. they might then support your business. Yeah. I, I'm, I was, I was, it's, it's funny, but I was, I was more, I'm more of an introvert. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I can get sometimes shy around people, uh, but there are synagogues here. And uh, I actually visited a couple of them uh, a little bit after my incident. And um my health, it, it wasn't getting any better. <laughs> it was just getting just a little better, but not enough to where I can stay out long period of times, you know, and drive long period of times. So I kind of strayed away from doing it. But um, they're still not they're not off the table, you know. It's just been a challenge, a uh, challenge, a challenge getting around for the most part with everything. But it's a consideration that I have thought about. Yeah. Well, not being a salesman yourself, you need somebody who could uh, do that part of the of the work for you. Uh, yeah, I think I think the fact that you are an introvert is is a um, would be very appealing to people who are interested in things like meditation. They don't they don't want uh, they don't want a hard sell on on, <laughs> on on the meditation front. That just doesn't work. That doesn't compute. Right. You know, somebody <laughs> asked me when I uh, teach meditation, I'm like. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. I just know how to do. <laughs> you know, that's what to teach, you know. And then to put me in front of a bunch of people to try to teach them. Say, Have you seen the way I talk these days? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. But nothing's off the table. I I I I'm always willing to try some everything to improve the life of others and myself, you know. Um that never wavered. Yeah. Regardless of whatever comes my way, never wait. You know. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that I think that's one of my strong suits is that it's hard to tell me no, and it's hard to tell me no and think that I'm not going to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> we have just a couple minutes left, and I, I, so I'm going to revert to, I, I, I went to Columbia University and afterwards worked at the Department of Welfare in New York, and my. Uh, my beat was Harlem, west side of uh, the city, above 125th Street, and uh, you've been there to to play the Apollo Theater with your with your dance team. Yeah, uh, tell, tell me a little about uh, how that show went. I I always loved the Apollo. Oh wow! It was um I want to say ninety four uh, Apollo Theater. They would have like a contest, international contest, looking for uh, uh looking for acts. So uh, me and my guys, we heard about it. We was like, let's uh, let's uh, let's audition for it. So they had auditions uh, on the east side of Chicago, 
and we were every a lot of dancers and people were out there, you know, ready to, uh, you know, audition. And it was like soon as it got to us, the lights and the power went out in the building. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so they had to cancel it oh. and reschedule. And it would just so happen that they contacted us to let us. They was contacting people, and we were one of the people they contact to actually come and audition again. You know audition so we auditioned um we got the we got the part to be in a in their program that they was having in chicago you oh. know we didn't know that they was going to have it in chicago and the people whoever wins the one in chicago gets to go to the one in new york hmm. so uh we were performing you know we you know got there to the performance you know met some of the acts backstage and everything and uh, we went out there and performed them because Chicago was very supportive of their own, you know, artists. Yes. Very supportive. So, you know, we went out there performed, you know, screams everywhere, you know, exciting. <laughs> and um, when they was choosing everybody, they chose us and we were like elated, you know, jumping around, swinging. we was excited, you know, and telling everybody, we're going to be on TV, we're going to be on TV. So... <laughs> So with that, it was like, as part of winning that contest, it was an all expense paid trip to New York, you know, uh, flight, hotel, everything. So uh, when we got to New York, we took the flight. It was my first time getting on an airplane. Uh, I was scared, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, when we got to New York, started seeing the sights and everything and uh, stayed in Manhattan. and. I think we had a limo take us to Harlem for the actual oh. show. So when we got there to the show, met Steve Harvey, because he was the host at the time. Uh-huh. And um, there was a couple of uh, acts, you know, that was going on. And I believe Hootie and the Blowfish, it was their first time going on the Apollo. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they were performing. So we got there to perform. And it's that way with every city where they where they support they own so some of the people who was we were going against was from that side from new york you know in that area so we lost to them <laughs> you know <laughs> but we had a great time they flew us back home and i would say three years later they were so impressed by us performing they said you guys can come on anytime you want nice. you know yeah. so we was like cool when the catch is you have to pay for everything <laughs> <laughs> so in, in that case it didn't happen huh oh it happened oh, oh you did? yeah we oh yeah we packed up in our cars our vans and we drove it was like almost 24 wow. hours from chicago to new york True. you know we had to pay for our hotel everything we didn't have much money so we had to stay in harlem at like a bed and breakfast yeah uh wasn't the best <laughs> but <laughs> We got to stay there and the show came again. Steve Harvey was the host. A couple of acts was there. And my guy, one of my guys, you we were backstage and uh, some of the people that was in the audience was backstage, you know, and he started talking crazy and joking about people in New York and all that. And the guys in New York, they was looking like, He's like, watch your mouth. <laughs> uh -oh. You know, we was like, man, be quiet, be quiet, you know. He said, watch, we're going to boo you all. As soon as you get on there, we're going to boo you. We was like, oh. oh. So we got to performing on the stage, and it so happened that those same guys right there by the mic. <laughs> right there by the mic. So uh. when Sandman Sims came out for everybody to, uh, to judge everybody, we got good view, reviews and people were standing when we performed, but those guys started booing. Uh. <laughs> you know, caused us to lose it. We looked at him like, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> but it was a great trip. It was a great experience. Uh, we had afterwards, we just couldn't do it anymore because everybody started having families and uh and it was it was like the end of the road everybody just started doing their own thing yeah. you know but it was it was but you got great... you got to do it yeah that's that's what we got to do it twice <laughs> and it was fun you know 
<laughs> well, Jay, it does uh, like I used to, but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, thank you so much for sharing your story. This is uh, this has been great. Um, uh, thank you so much for having me. And, and tell uh, tell listeners again how they can find your website. Uh, you can find my website at um, www dot dot left that's d a l e t h dash a m dash sanctuary dot com and it's a free site come on there find anything you need that can help you find that inner peace and get closer to the guy everything is welcome when it comes down to getting closer to god terrific terrific thanks jay Thanks again. I really appreciate it. I was yeah. I was nervous. I don't know if you felt it, but I was nervous. First no, time doing this. You you did great. <laughs> if <laughs> listeners I appreciate it. would like to hear the show again or any of our more than four hundred and fifty archived ad free NDE interviews, go to Talk Zone's NDE radio site, hit the past shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.